It was the world according to TARP down in Atlanta's Fulton County Stadium Sunday. But as the old saying goes, the show must go on. And go on it did. Falcon veteran Alfred Jenkins was one of the most anxious to take the rain-soaked stage, for on this day, he could become Atlanta's all-time leading receiver with his first catch of the soggy afternoon. O.J. Anderson and his fellow St. Louis Cardinals are the opposition in this NFC Conference clash, a team that hopes to atone for a 31-20 loss suffered a week earlier at the hands of the world champion 49ers. E.J. Jr. and the Card defense will have their work cut out for them. For in their last two meetings with Atlanta, twice they saw big halftime leads overcome by the likes of William Andrews. In 1980, a 24-6 Cardinal halftime lead ended in a 33-27 loss. And last season, a 14-0 halftime edge was erased by Andrews in the vaunted Falcon attack as Atlanta went on to win 41-20. If St. Louis is to weather a Falcon comeback today in this weather, they'll have to contend with a new face on Atlanta's roster, or rather an old face in a new uniform. Billy White Shoes Johnson was acquired from Montreal, and he's been tearing it up in his old home, the NFL, this season as a Falcon return man. Cardinal head coach Jim Hannafin is a happy man, having had his contract extended through 1984 recently. A victory today would put his Cardinals in the thick of things at 2-2. Two and two. And if youngsters like Neil Lomax and veterans like Mel Gray, number 85, have a big day, it could be a long day for Atlanta. The player strike has made this shortened season a mini playoff tournament where each win is of supreme importance, and today is certainly no different. From Atlanta, it's the Cardinals and the Falcons, a battle of the birds, if you will, on the NFL Game of the Week. A week earlier, Atlanta destroyed the Rams 34 to 17 as their offense showed no ill effects from the eight week layoff. And when they took over on their first possession, a muddied field proved to be no problem either, as Lynn Kane and number 31, William Andrews, found the wet stuff to their liking. On their opening drive, Atlanta ran 11 times and passed just three times, the first of which was a very special catch indeed. Number 84, Alfred Jenkins, gained but eight yards on this reception, but it was reception number 306, which put him above veteran Jim Mitchell as Atlanta's all-time leading pass catcher. Steve Barkowski stayed with a good thing as Jenkins' streak of 93 consecutive games with the reception was lengthened as was the Falcon drive downfield. Atlanta ate up nearly eight and a half minutes on the drive, a drive which unfortunately resulted in only three points, thanks to kicker Mick Luckhurst. Luckhurst's boot bit through the rain and gave Atlanta a three to nothing lead, and the Falcons knew that if they were to protect that slim advantage, they would have to do two things, contain the mobile Neil Lomax and St. Louis's all-pro freight train O.J. Anderson. They did neither. Lomax and Anderson move St. Louis easily despite a defense that swarms in waves. Anderson's 20-yard jaunt was made possible by a nifty block by Wayne Morris, number 24, and a shifty cut on the wet field. Morris has two specialties. One is blocking for Anderson, and the second is scoring touchdowns from in close. Morris is finicky, but in tight, he eats anything put in front of him. In this case, he ate up two yards, the Falcon front line and Atlanta's three to nothing lead. St. Louis led seven to three, and for the Falcons, an old salty expression suddenly came into play. When it rains, it pours.
Number 73, Mike Dawson, came up with Barkowski's deflected toss, and a repeat shows that the turnover was caused by Curtis Greer, number 75, who batted Bart's toss high in the sky. Dawson was simply an alert lineman in the right place at the right time. Such a turnover was peculiar, for as a rule, Barkowski has a real field day when he plays against St. Louis. Last season, he tied a club record with four touchdown passes against them. On the next play, his counterpart, Neil Lomax, fared little better. John Smith sacked Lomax for a loss of 13, but once Neo slipped comfortably into the shotgun, he quickly showed why his teammates call him the gateway gunner. Number 83, Pat Tilly hauled in Lomax's throw for a 34-yard gain, the Cardinals' longest play in the half. And then O.J. Anderson, with the help of another rock-solid block from Morris, executed St. Louis's most important play of the half. Anderson scored from 20 yards out and would finish with 70 yards on merely nine carries in the first two quarters alone. O.J. had gained over a thousand in each of his first three seasons, and runs like this prove why he is the team's all-time rushing leader after only three years of service. Anderson gave St. Louis an 11-point cushion, and true to form, the Cardinals had carved out an early lead. Atlanta didn't want to wait until the second half to mount a comeback as they had in years past. The Big Red secondary refused to allow the big play, a Falcon trademark. So Bart took a more conservative course with runners like rookie Gerald Riggs, number 42, and William Andrews. Riggs and Andrews ran straight and hard, but again Atlanta had to settle for three as St. Louis once more bent but didn't break, as number 27 Carl Allen stopped a reverse short of a key first down. Atlanta scratched away at St. Louis's lead, but they needed someone to light a fire under them, and they had just the right man for the job, Billy White Shoes Johnson. White Shoes became Billy Mud Shoes, and quickly Atlanta came up with the big play they so sorely needed. Billy Johnson, at age 31, proved he still has a lot of the same stuff that made him the NFL's premier punt returner a couple of years back with Houston. Against Los Angeles, he returned three for 93 yards, including a 71-yarder that set up Atlanta's tying touchdown. This TD was called back. Look again carefully and you'll see a pair of clips that nullified it. It's worth repeating just to get a look at the patented white shoes shuffle anyhow.
The emotional peak and subsequent valley of a touchdown called back had a damaging effect on the hometown as Bartkowski again took the helm for Atlanta. The Falcons moved downfield again, only to have two holding calls and a delay of game penalty impede their progress. On yet another drive late in the half, Barkowski ended the thrust downfield himself. Indeed, it had been a most frustrating 30 minutes of football for the Falcons and head coach Lehman Bennett. But deep down, he knew one simple fact. An 18-point deficit and a 14-point deficit had been overcome against St. Louis in the last two years. And now his team trailed by merely eight. In the first half, the St. Louis Cardinals were able to pick up better than six yards on every rushing attempt they tried. They looked at the scoreboard and saw they were ahead 14 to six. Concurring that it was the run that earned the lead, the Cards tried this approach again. But the Falcons proved far less generous this time around. O.J. Anderson and Wayne Morris quickly discovered that paths previously open were not as easily accessible. The St. Louis ground game, while not shackled completely, would not be as prosperous in the game's final 30 minutes. One fellow who continued to be effective no matter what, though, was Falcon punt returner White Shoes Johnson. Unlike Johnson's first half score that had been scratched by penalty, this return was legal. It gave Atlanta good field position, and on the very next play, the cards gave Atlanta great field position. Number 27, Carl Allen, was flagged for pass interference, giving the Falcons first and goal on the three. Steve Bartkowski then completed the whirlwind drive with a toss to a seldom used teammate. Fullback Bo Robinson hauled in the throw to bring the Falcons to within a point. Robinson, a former starting fullback with the Detroit Lions, has the misfortune of playing behind Atlanta great William Andrews. But as he proved here, Robinson is ready to contribute when called upon. The Cardinals had watched their one substantial lead dwindle to a single point. Up to now, they had passed only six times throughout the entire game. One reason was the rainy weather, which could turn a streaking spiral into a dying quail. Another factor was St. Louis's young offensive line and its ability to open holes so O.J. Anderson could run through Atlanta's defense. And after some early third period problems, O.J. was on the road again. Almost exclusively on the ground, the Cardinals took nearly seven minutes and 13 plays on their third quarter march. Although St. Louis didn't get a touchdown, they did get some breathing room as Neil O'Donohue banged home a field goal from 43 yards. Despite the fact that St. Louis was outscored during the third period, they dominated time of possession, holding on for nearly 13 minutes. 
Neil Lomax continued to pass sparingly, but when he did throw, things didn't turn out all that badly. Lomax was also able to pick up yardage on foot, turning a pass rollout into a sizable gain. As the fourth quarter commenced, Lomax fired a critical completion to Pat Tilly, a receiver who had served Lomax well in the first half. Tilly was just as timely on this drive. Now came the most significant series of the game. It was first and goal St. Louis at the two, but Atlanta was in no mood to give up another touchdown. Three straight Wayne Morris runs were tried. None succeeded. Falcons had proven too stubborn for the card, so on fourth and inches, St. Louis coach Jim Hannafin called for the field goal unit. As expected, O'Donohue easily converted the attempt, but Atlanta was flagged with a costly penalty. The officials ruled the Falcons had too many men on the field. It was still fourth and goal at the half-inch line, and rather than take the points on the board, Hannafin sent the offense back on the field to try for the touchdown. Lomax barely got in as the Cardinal gamble paid off, but six points was all they got as the extra point was missed. <laughs> Having seen a dramatic goal line stand turned against them, the Falcons needed a spark and got one from rookie runner Gerald Ring. Riggs broke from the blocks with a 37-yard pickup, his longest run as a pro. A second look shows it was a great cutback and good blocking from the left side of the Falcon line that made the play work. Then Riggs got the call on four consecutive plays, but none were as eventful as his long dash thanks to a swarming Cardinal defense. Still, these small gains put Atlanta within range, and Barkowski capitalized when he spotted the very wide open Alfred Jackson, number 85. Someone in the Cardinals secondary had made a coverage mistake, and Atlanta's other receiving Alfred had his first touchdown reception of 1982. Atlanta was now breathing down the Cardinals' collective necks. With a three-point lead and six minutes to go, St. Louis did not relish the idea of throwing into the rain. As they had all game, the cards kept it on the ground. But now the yards were getting tougher and tougher to come by as Atlanta's defense tightened. St. Louis managed to eat up a good deal of time, but they could not kill the clock entirely. Atlanta took over with one more chance to win or tie. St. Louis was playing soft, giving up the short completion to prevent the big play. So Barkowski threw underneath to his backs, and they picked up key yardage. A pass interference call had hurt St. Louis early in the half and it happened again in the final seconds. 
the penalty put the Falcons within range for a tying field goal. But before trying a kick, Barkowski had time for one more pass and a chance at winning the game in regulation. And Bart's toss nearly gave Atlanta a stirring last-second victory. With six seconds to go on the clock, kicker Mick Luckers lined up for a 42-yard attempt. Luckers' luck had been good so far. Two field goals made in two tries, plus marriage earlier in the week to pro golfer Terry Moody. But here, Mick's good fortune came to an end. The ball sliced wide left, and the Cardinals' victory was complete as they escaped rainy Atlanta with a 23-20 decision. St. Louis had not been expected to win, yet they did so with a running game that until today had not been effective. Like the Falcons, Jim Hannafin's squad is now 2-2 two and two and in the thick of the NFL playoff picture. At the beginning of the season, many observers felt the Cardinals would be improved, but doomed to also ran status because of their membership in the tough NFC East. But with the restructured post-strike schedule, divisions are a thing of the past. The Birds have a chance to play in postseason for the first time since 1975, a prospect that sounds pretty good to their long-suffering fans in the Gateway City.